Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Blog Chat. I'm Matt Hill, and this is Chris Nicholson. We're from National Parks at Night, and we have yet another Tuesday edition of We Wrote Something, Now We're Going to Talk About. It. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, because writing is not enough. We've got to We've got to get all the words out, all the words that didn't fit in the blog post. We're going to speak, right? That's pretty yeah. much what this is. I mean, like, there's so many ways to communicate. Why not sweat all of the assets? So, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so any any news on your end before we launch into this? You had a busy day with live streams. Yeah, yeah. This is my fourth live stream today. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I did two on Sunday as part, uh, on Saturday as That's part of right. the the out of Chicago live conference, which was amazing. There were over 800 attendees of that, but like two of them and I was wiped out. So I can't imagine how you're feeling right now. Wow. I, I, I think we have a lot of empathy for each other. I did, in 30 <laughs> seconds, tell me more about what happened with out of Chicago. Oh, out of Chicago live was great. Um, that's, you know, I love their conferences anyway. They're like workshops on steroids. You get like 15, 20 instructors, speakers, right? Um, but the speakers, like most conferences, they just do a talk and they're done, right? But at the out of Chicago conferences, um, which they have at Acadia, Moab, they're doing one at Death Valley next year. Uh, the speakers also lead photo excursions. So their conferences are just as much, they're more about shooting right, than the presentations. I mean, you actually go out and shoot. Um, and when the whole... COVID-19 thing happened, um, uh, Chris Smith, who's the director of those conferences, uh, put this together really quickly. I can't imagine how they did this this fast to put together a conference. They got 72 speakers from the different conferences they've had, and it was all online, and it was global because it was online, right? They had over 800 attendees come for three days of online talks. There, I mean, there had to be 10 talks going on at a time. And um, uh, the really cool thing I thought for the attendees is that if you are registered, if you were registered, that you get one year access to the recorded videos of those presentations. So for a three hundred dollar conference fee, you've got one year of access to over a hundred videos of uh, these photography experts talking about what they're expert in. It was a great deal. It was a really dynamic conference. They, they did a bang up job on it, and they announced that they're doing another one next year. Woo! Yeah, yeah, it was really great. Uh, you weren't the only guy from Edpan that was out of Chicago, were you? No, uh, Tim Cooper, um, uh, he was there, and uh, Gabe Biederman was uh, was there representing BNH, which sponsored it. And uh, if I don't want to speak out of turn, I'm pretty sure that BNH is sponsoring it again next year. So, That's wonderful. Yeah, wow. yeah, I'm pretty sure they said that they announced that. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it was really great. So. I saw Jerry already said something in the live chat. He said he's glad that it was being recorded. He couldn't go to all the sessions that he wanted to. Mm -hmm. I hope you attended. Chris. Yeah. Well, <laughs> when, when, there's, when there's that many at once, you can't go to them all, right? Um, right? But that was the thing. I thought it was a good deal even without the recordings. But being able to go back and watch any of that stuff you want for a year, yeah, it was, it was great. And we did see... Um, I didn't tell you this. Uh, we saw a, a, several NPAN alums. Uh, Jen Bookman was there, mm -hmm. um, and uh, Barbara from Florida. Uh, I think I saw Dave Curtin there. Um, it was yeah, it was really nice to see familiar. Uh, well, I guess it, they're not familiar faces because I couldn't see their face, but the familiar <laughs> names pop in and contribute to the chats, and it was really great. Jen just agreed. She said it was really well done. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Great. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so we got to talk about the blog. I don't know about right. you. I am like stuffed. I just finished dinner. My mm. daughter, Maggie, hi Maggie. Uh, she made turkey meatloaf. She's seven years old and she's gotten into making meatloaf and she made this great meatloaf and then cookies and I'm stuffed, but I'm ready to talk about meteors. That's fantastic. I oh, wait, I'm, I'm dreaming about dinner for a moment. Okay. I'm back. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. So this has been, um, this has been an ongoing topic for us for, uh, eight days now. Um, because uh, 2020 uh, is is going to be a good year for meteor showers. Um, the the we've got three happening during a new moon, um, and the first one was just uh, I guess we're still in it. It peaked last week, uh, but we are still in the meteor shower. Uh, and then the the Perseids in August are going to be under a 40 percent moon, and you know that's a great meteor shower to begin with. So even even though there's some moonlight. That's still going to be a great photo opportunity. So you got four really good opportunities to shoot meteor showers this year, and um, so we did this 
you know, this, um, this string of blog posts, it was a three part series uh, where first we covered uh, how to use photo pills to plan a meteor shower shoot. Uh, then you wrote a post on how to actually execute the shoot. And we talked about both of those on blog chat last week. Uh, and then this week, what we want to talk about is your new post that came out yesterday on how to process those photos. Because uh, doing a really good dynamic meteor shower photo isn't about one shot, right? No, no. Yeah. <laughs> Dozens, uh, hundreds, thousands. Uh, yeah. So we're going to talk about that. And then we'll also, at the end, we'll talk about the, the ebook that we just released yesterday, too Great Balls of Fire, uh, which includes all of the information from the blog posts uh, plus some other stuff. We'll get into that later. Uh, so now let's, you know, let's start talking about that processing. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so like you say, you've got a, a, a ton of photos from a meteor shower shoot. Yeah. It's, uh, it, oh, wow. How, how, where do I start? Okay. I, you have to pick one picture. That's really where it starts. So you've got hundreds of pictures potentially. Mm -hmm. And, and, and now you have to say, this is the one with the sky that I think is the most advantageous to show off this meteor shower radiant. Uh, and that's that's what I did. And I'm gonna show, share my screen real quick to show everybody what I'm talking about. Uh, what does advantageous mean? Well, basically it means if there's one frame that you could choose just for the sky, that is the best sky out of dozens or hundreds of pictures. For me, it was this one. And it's funny because the last two times I edited this, I chose different pictures. <laughs> but this time I realized that the clouds, the clouds coming out and away from the radiant were also going to frame the radiant a little bit better next time okay. when, I, when I found all of those. Yeah. And I really liked that the Milky Way ended up nestling perfectly into the corner this way and leading yeah. the eye back down in. That so, was the part that jumped out to me is how those those clouds frame the bottom of the Milky Way like that and kind of create that V that the Milky Way is coming right into. I mean, just even without the meteors, that's a solid composition. Thanks, man. Yeah, well, I think that's important, right? Like whenever we're talking yeah. about some sort of special technique that we're doing, it's easy to forget about the fundamentals of composition because that 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 technique, that cool factor of a fun technique sort of distracts you. Uh, it's easy, you know, it's easy for it to distract you and you forget about composition. The photo still needs to be based in a solid composition and you did that here. Oh, thank you. It, it, I knew from photo pills that the, the Milky Way was gonna be scooting around through the corner. So I was, I was betting. I was betting that I was gonna have a composition like this. And I remember the third time I processed it that that's what I wanted. <laughs> oh, I also, I processed the sky differently this time. Uh, with the new processing tools available in Lightroom and um, different aesthetic choices, I realized that I wanted this guy to be a little bit brighter. I made it inky black last time. And this time by choosing a brighter sky, I realized that I had decided to negate this beautiful sky glow that's going on there. Not only is there weird light on the horizon, right? That's it's lining the clouds, but I've got these like magenta, red, green, almost yellowish stripes going up through all of this, like cross hatching the Milky Way, which is further adding to the interestingness. If that's a permissible word, is that judges? Yeah. Judges? Okay. Interestingness of the image. Yeah. The, how about the interestingicity? <laughs> Interestinositicity? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I picked a picture and you might spend 20 minutes or 30 minutes trying to pick out just the right one and flipping back and forth. It took me about 10 minutes to decide on this one. Um, and I edited this, like I said, knowing that I still wanted the meteors to be brighter than this. Um, and I said, okay, boom. And I, I hit a flag on that one. I hit the five stars. I'm not like Tim. I have a different way of doing things, but I'm going to bend my will to change to be like Tim. Okay. Hey, Matt, make, let's, yeah. let's back up 10 seconds because you said something really interesting. What's that? You want the meteors to be brighter than your sky, Yeah. right? So mm -hmm. what, what, what are you shooting there? Uh, what are you shooting for there? Well, it's, it's, it's about competition, right? If the brightest, our eyes are going to pick out the brightest things as being the most important thing in, in the scene. Mm -hmm. So if the meters are the brightest thing, they thus become the most important thing, whether we like it or not, our eyes are going to be drawn to them. Yeah. 
Okay. So by choosing to make the background darker on purpose, but not totally black like the, the other time I processed it, uh, I'm trying to strike a balance between you know, like color and harmony and like context. Okay. All right. So that just goes back to composition 101. The brightest thing in a scene or the, the point of highest contrast in a scene is what your eye is drawn to. And so you're sort of using a darker background with uh, brighter meteors and creating those high points of contrast specifically to draw the eye to those meteors. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they're on fire. So they should be the brightest thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, literally on fire. I literally, didn't have to yes. say literally. Oh, geez. That's okay. Th that word, it's just beaten around and smacked. And... But you used it correctly. Thank you. Thank you. Literally. Literally. <laughs> let's, let's move on. Okay. So uh, <laughs> after I made that edit, I then selected all of the other images so that the sky would be the, the same. And I synchronized the settings, except for spot removal, because um, that wouldn't have helped. And I, I synced it up across all of the images, right? Um, and then for this one image, I had to get rid of uh, some planes, right? And then in the blog post here, as a refresher, I have a very deep dive into how to remove planes, plane trails from images, but I, I gave a, a gentle refresher on what's the difference between all of these celestial objects or terrestrial objects in the air. Yeah. And um, sometimes it's a fine difference. Yeah, right. And it can be hard to tell the difference sometimes. This one's easy. This is a plane. Yeah. Dot, 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 dot. Easy. And it's got a clean beginning and a clean ending. Mm -hmm. That's, and on the next frame, you'll see it pick up where this one left off. Yeah. And another key thing with the, with the planes is if you ever see the lines and they make a sudden turn, of that, that's a plane. Because there's nothing else up there that's making 45 degree turns. I need to stop you right there. Really? There's, there's none, no oh, unidentified flying objects? Nothing, nothing that the military admits to, anyway. I was in that valley in Colorado where all those UFO settings are supposed to be, so. Yeah. Eh, moving on. So yeah, this is a plane. Uh, and this was an Iridium satellite. And this, this could be a false positive for a lot of people uh, because it tapers in. Yeah, and it tapers out. Uh, you can easily mistake this for, uh, yeah. Yeah. It, now, I have seen iridium, uh, you know, iridium satellites and photos where they get even fatter than this in the middle, and so that's a pretty good telltale sign because uh, you know you're getting the reflection from the satellite as it's hitting the sun, and if you know if if everything lines up right, I mean that really can that that highlight can really blow up on you. But uh, yeah, in this case, I could. I could mistake this for a meteor. Yeah, and it's we'll get to sporadics later. It could you could say it's this or say it's that, but if it doesn't align with the radiant, yeah, then it's an easy decision, and we'll we'll get into that later. Yeah, and and then one other thing on the iridiums is they're becoming less frequent because they did retire these, and there's still a few floating around up there. Um, right. I've read six, eight, ten. I've read in that range. Um, so you right. still do get them, but not as much as you used to. But this is from 2017, so they're definitely still around. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think they retired the fleet in 2018. 2018, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Now there's now there's Musk satellites up there, but yeah. that's a different story. A whole other blog post. <laughs> uh, the ISS can zoom across the sky, mm -hmm. and I turned all these sideways, but my experience, I've seen the ISS be kind of perpendicular to most things. But I could be totally wrong about that. Don't. Flame me in the contents and the comments, but you can see it's clean at the beginning, clean at the end, but there's no dots on either side. Mm -hmm. And it's usually a lot thinner than a plane's uh, marking a trail because it's much further away from the earth. So um, yeah, this one you can see is really zoomed in. Look at all the mm -hmm. pixels there. Those beautiful pixels. Yeah. A and then finally, this is, I left it for last because it makes it easiest to understand. Meteors often have fantastic colors associated with them because they're burning up in an oxygen rich atmosphere, coming into more oxygen and they will turn colors and they will flare and they do taper in and they do taper out. And also they move very quickly. Planes move much slower by comparison. There'll be a multiple frames. You'll only find meteors 
99% of the time in one frame, unless you happen to bridge over mm -hmm. that interval between frames. Right. Yeah. And the odds of that are slim. Very. I even went into the math in the blog post. <laughs> it did. Yeah. And with so, a one second interval, what most meteors, you know, don't last that long anyway. Gone. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, you could completely miss a meteor during an interval. Totally. Oh, okay. So, so this is now you know what a meteor looks like, and you got to go find them. So you need to go into your catalog and you need to go in and zoom in to every single picture, or stay out. And I use the color yellow to indicate which were meteors. So, yeah, I I didn't see a lot of meteors, but it wasn't a big year for the Perseids either. So I just marked those. So I didn't need to make a giant layered Photoshop document later. I just needed to pull out only the images that were necessary. Mm -hmm. This said, you had a pretty good yield for, you know, what was kind of a low activity night. Uh, so you did, I mean, and you had the moon coming up, you know, so you were fighting some things and you got, you did, you did really well for those conditions. Thanks. Well, like, practice makes perfect, right? <laughs> so 325 images 23 frames with meteors that said seven percent ended up having meteors and not all of them did i keep and we'll talk more about that in a second right so uh we talked in the previous blog post about finding your foreground right so if this if my this was the one i showed earlier so i crushed the blacks in this one so that it'd be easier to to mask out mm -hmm the ground. And this one, I just sort of crushed the highlights and the whites so that'd be easier to find the edges down here. I was, by this time, I was, it was a four hour edit and I was just like, all right, I want to be done with this. Okay. So I did try and do it the quick and dirty way to do this. Yeah. Well, it's a great technique um, for people who might not be familiar. Can you explain what you mean by crushing the blacks and the highlights? Sure. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm going to pull up Lightroom while that's coming up. What it essentially means is that when I'm, oh gosh, it's in a different catalog. I'm just going to take the, the highlights and pull them more towards the yeah. bright hey, edge. Hey, Matt, we are still seeing the, yeah, uh, the blog post. Okay. Yeah, I know. I, I, I don't have those images in this catalog that just loaded up. So okay. I have to sort of cover that. But there, you just you outed me, man. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So you're pointing to just the screen now. Yeah. Okay. All right. Go ahead. So go ahead and point at the photos and yeah. So so it, in in this area, I pulled down a gradient, and you know what? I can I can do this with any image. So let me just I'll pretend I'll just pull okay. up something here. So if this was, we'll find something with a brightish sky, right? All right. We'll go in here. We'll hit develop. If I wanted to crush the highlights, I would pull up a gradient like this and I would pull the whites up and pull up the highlights. And then I'm just gonna, I'm gonna turn it on and off so you guys can see. Like all it's doing is creating more detail there. And you can see if I came in and selected something, I would later on in Photoshop, I'd be more likely to pick out the fine details along this edge uh, when I'm creating a mask later. Right. Now, granted, there weren't a lot of trees in that scene. So your results may vary depending on how much fine detail you have along the horizon. Right. And again, so this isn't because you want the photo to look like this. This is so that it makes it easier to mask what you need to mask in Photoshop later Precisely. on. And we'll see that when we get there. Yeah, yeah, and I already have I have the PSB loaded up so I can show you guys what the masking looked like. Uh, so, so yeah, in this one, I didn't, I processed the the foreground to look gentler, not like daylight. I processed this to look like night, and I tried to make them believable together. And then I made the the sky brighter here and the ground darker there, so it'd be easier to blend them. Uh, yeah, and I put those into layers, so. I took all of these images and I opened them in Photoshop as if I was making a star trail stack. So and this just, is just the images with the meteors. 
this was just the images with the meteors. I, I pulled up those other two later and dragged them into the Photoshop document. But you could theoretically take all of your meteor images plus your foreground and your perfect sky image mm -hmm. and put them in this grouping and do the same thing and they'd all be in one PSD. But I just selected edit in, open as layers in Photoshop and then you wait and wait and wait and you end up with something that doesn't look like this, you know, something that looks more like this. I, I made a, a special, let's, does this zoom for you guys? No, I'm not even gonna try that. Um, <clears throat> I made a, a PSB that's twice as big as it should be. I duplicated all of these layers so that I could have them without the masks to demo it for you now. And then I could also show you with the, this is the sporadics and that. So, so let's start with what I was just talking about. Um, this is my sky and this is my ground, right? So this is the ground with the mask applied and I'm gonna disable it. So all I did was I grabbed the wand and I just started pulling like that. And you see the marching ants ended up very easily selecting a perfect outline because the rest of this, those highlights were crushed. They're very bright. And on my wand selection tool, the quick selection or magic wand here, the point sample and it's tolerance too. And it just, it made it really easy to select that. And then I would, I turned this into uh, a mask by clicking on the layer mask and then it's gone. Uh, it's not deleted, it's just masked out. Right. And the opposite I did for the sky. So the sky, I didn't want the ground. I'm gonna disable that mask. It's very dark. So when I go in there with the wand and I select, it's very easy just to have uh, the ground there. And it's a little unfair for me to select the mask, which is a perfect black right now, but that's what happens. So, um, and then I that mask comes out. And then when you put the two together, it's just like that. That's and they, great. They blend together. Now, when I did it, there was a little bit of a pixel drift there and I'm mm -hmm. going to demonstrate it. Like, let's say eh, I'm trying to push it down here. Uh, you're just nudging it down with the move yeah. tool. Oh, you know what? I locked these layers because I didn't want that to happen. There we go. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to nudge it down. And yeah, you're just using the move tool. Yeah, are, they, just, are you are you doing that with uh, with with the mouse, a tablet, or the cursor keys? I am using the cursor keys. I should have mouse pose on to show you guys. That's what yeah. I should do. Well, there no, we I'm with it because yeah. there's different ways to use the move tool. But when you're talking about moving, yeah. just at the pixel right. you know, pixel level, the cursor keys are the easiest way to control that. Yeah, for sure. And I even hold down the shift key so it happens faster. Um, yeah. So everything's locked, and I'm just going to undo all that. So there was a little bit of a gap there. And all I did was I crept it up like five pixels and it was perfect. Yeah. It was a, it was a, uh, an Ill, inelegant solution that ended up looking like gold. So, well, you know, it's a little bit of a cheat, but if you're only talking about a few pixels, there's yeah. times when you can get away with it. Yeah. And, and this is a perfect example because all you're, you know, all you're covering up is the sky. So yeah. you're not, covering anything really important in the composition where it's going to be obvious that something was different. You're just moving that horizon line up a few pixels uh, so that you can cover up your mask and everything looks great because all you're doing is covering up a few pixels of sky. There we go. Yeah. yeah. So it was kind of like that where you could see like, it was just like, eh, and then I went up like that and it was done. Yeah. Eh, eh. Easy. Eh, it's, eh. A, it's, a, yeah. it's a much easier solution than trying to get in there and, and massage the mask. Right. And the only thing I had to do then was to go find those pixels down at the bottom and use the marquee tool mm -hmm. and, and crop off those extra pixels. That's it. So, yeah. So that was the sky and ground blend. And now the stage is set and absolutely lock those layers so that you don't ruin them, you know? Um, yeah. And that was, that was a good thing to do. Uh, and then you come in with all these meteor layers and I'm going to turn off these other layers so we don't have to see those, but let's say there's a meteor here 
we found a meteor, yay, we found a meteor, what do we do with it, right? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you guys quickly because this is, um, it was described in the blog post, but it's a lot easier to see it now. Make sure you select your layer and you wanna hit the, the D key on your keyboard, D for dog, to change your foreground color black to back to black. And you wanna make your, your brush just a little bit bigger than the meteor shower, but also soft, you know, make sure it's got a little bit of uh, featheriness to it. And then you wanna click once at the beginning, oops. You wanna add a layer mask first, click once at the beginning, and then hold down shift and click to the end. And now I've painted it out. And then if you hit command I on a Mac, or if you go up to, oh, see, this is where I, I do this, invert. So invert, adjustments, invert, there we go. If you ever can't find anything, you do what Matt does and search for it and help. <laughs> invert. There it is. And you're going to invert the mask and then you can go clean it up. But what you, what you really want to do is be as accurate as possible painting it out. Instead of trying to paint out everything else, invert the mask. And then you can go in here and really zoom in and take your time, you know, to click just outside of it and then shift click to take bites out of it like that with a softer brush. And you're going to clean it up. And remember, this is going to end up on a really dark sky, so you might not need to clean it up as much as you think. Um, and then, yeah, I'm going to be a little careful with this one, and I'm going to show you the results on the rest of them. Boom. So now, if I turn back on my, my lower layers, there's that meteor. And we'll see how it blends in. And that's when you can really tell whether you have to go in and do a little bit more work, like down here. I might do like a little bit more to blend this in, you know. Matt, are you uh, changing the blend mode on that layer or are you just keeping it at normal? I'm keeping it normal, man. Okay. There's there's some people that would, would say that you want to use Lighten. Um, but I don't really see the reason to do that. Um, but... Look at that. I see some stars go away. It's a good idea, Chris. There we go. Beautiful. So that's that's one meteor. You have to repeat that for every layer that you found a meteor in. So you would go spend some time masking in all of the rest of your meteors. Um, and then you need to do another thing, which is this frame that I'm showing you here was not shot at the same time as the master frame. So this was frame 7805 and the master frame, let's say for the sake of argument was 7842. The sky was rotating during that time. The earth was spinning, hurtling through, through space. So what we need to do is we're going to disable the layer mask real quick. You see how everything is offset here? So we need to change this so that this meteor is pretending to be in the same time that it was. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to transform this by going Command T or Edit Transform. And then you need to move the center point to the actual center of your frame. Or if it's not in frame, if it's not the Perseids or a meteor shower, it's in frame, you need to pick a spot off off scene and rotate it around that. But basically I'm gonna put this in the middle of True North. This is Polaris, right? And I'm going to then change my layer opacity to 50%. And then while we're still in rotate here, which that turned off when I did my layer opacity, I'm going to go up to the amount of the rotation up here and I'm just going to start using my arrow keys and the shift key to turn this until they line up. And I'm going to zoom in and I've still got that selected. And when you see a Polaris match up with Polaris, you're kind of in the right place. So I went the wrong way. 
And a trick that I have is I just copy the number from one layer to the next. Um, so when I'm done with this, if it says 2.7 or negative 2.7, I'll copy that to the next one and then start from there and keep going because it's always going to be traveling in the same direction. So here we go. They're starting to line up, starting to line up, starting to line up. And you don't need to be perfect. You just need to be pretty darn close, right? And that's it. So that's minus 6.9 degrees. I'm going to zoom back out. And you see how much it's turned. So just to be clear, what you're doing here is uh, you're moving the photo, you're rotating the photo in the same way that the sky appears to be rotating during the shoot. Uh, the reason you're doing this is so that the radiant is in the same position in each of the layers. Is that right? Yes, precisely that. And I will, I'm going to pop out of Photoshop so we can look at this at the same time. Yes, because if the, the meteors are supposed to be coming from a particular place in the sky, and that would be the constellation Perseus for the Perseids, it's moving around during the night. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is correcting for that. So that if the meteor came from Perseus while it was down here, boo, and then Perseus moved up here, and they came out again, boo, you need to rotate those layers so they all pop into the same place from your master layer. Right. Okay. And just to be clear, because I, I haven't shot a meteor shower in Great Sand Dunes, that's what the meteors sound like there? No, they sound like zzz. Oh, okay. Yeah. I make noises and I am oh, proud of it. So do I. Okay. So you need to lock it in after this. So you hit enter um, and that locks in that turning and then you set your opacity back to 100% and you make sure your, your layer mask goes back on. And now your meteor should be pointing right towards where Perseus is in the scene, just like that. And multiply that times the number of meteors that you found frames, All right? Uh, yeah. So if you do that, it's gonna look something like this, where I'm gonna turn these off. And now we've got all these meteors and this is what I did. And I learned something while I was doing this that like, yeah, there's, there's little meteors, there's giant meteors, there's all different colors in here. There's very faint ones, right? And once I had turned all of them, I saw that not all of them point towards uh, Perseus. And I'm gonna turn those on now. You see these, this guy right here, Look at this guy, and this guy, what's he doing? And this guy, weren't they all supposed to be coming from Perseus? Chris, what's going on here? I don't understand. Well, I, I have one guess. What's that? Um, you could be seeing a meteor or two left over from the Southern Delta of Aquarius. Absolutely right. And I didn't even think about that. I think you pointed that out. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, 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 I, I guess the, uh, the short version is that not every meteor coming into our atmosphere is from the same cloud of debris. There is, you know, a meteor shower is caused by the Earth moving through a cloud of debris left over from a comet. But there are other things in space that aren't parts, you know, part of those clouds of debris. So there, you know, it's entirely possible uh, every night that there's just a, a random meteor uh, coming through the sky. Uh, they could be left over. There are some meteor showers that overlap, and the Southern Delta Aquarids are not one of the meteor showers that we think of uh, as having a high yield to go out and shoot. They're a little earlier in the summer. Uh, they peak a little earlier in the summer, um, but they do overlap. So it is possible that you could have a meteor or two from uh, left over from that cloud of debris uh, at the same time as, as the Perseids that you were shooting that night. I, I love that. And this is why I love teaching with you, man. I learn new stuff from you all the time. The thing that I learned when I was going through this, I said, why are those meteors not pointing in the right place? And they could totally be from that meteor shower is there's these things called sporadics. There's just meteors that are, right? It might be from that meteor shower. It just might be debris, period. You know, like something mm -hmm. that's not associated with 
a particular tale of a comet or you know something that's repeatable planable or predictable uh they're called sporadics so um that's what i keep flashing on the screen over here i'm going to show that again this time instead of saying i'm going to keep all of the meteors i said i want to tell the most accurate story i can and also the most aesthetically pleasing story since this is a fiction to begin with if i left in all these other meteors they're drawing my attention away from the, the radiant and you see when i turn them on it's just like ew i don't want those so i put them into another folder called sporadics and i took them out i willingly took away i had a meager set of meteors to begin with and i willingly took them away and out of the composition and said bye bye after all of that work but i think it serves the composition yeah. i think it serves it really well well you also you know you're, you're you're calling this a fiction and i i know what you mean but uh you're telling a non-fiction story with this photo um e even though maybe graphically it's not something that would have plausibly happened right. um but you are you know, what you've chosen to do is narrow down the meteors that you captured to just the ones that are coming from Perseus and telling the story of, of that meteor shower and where, and where those meteors come from and how they would look in the sky if you could bend time and view it that way. Precisely fiction. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get it. I get it. It's, you're right. It's a nonfiction approach to saying this is, this is truth. These are the boundaries of truth. And I want to show the meteors only coming from that radiant during the night, but it's still a composite. You know, right. like I, it's, it's no, I'm, no, no scientific review is looking at my body of work and saying, uh, he missed a sporadic or you shouldn't have taken that one out. That actually came from the radiant. Well, I will tell you this though, just challenge that thought a little bit. I've got somebody on my side. If you look in Tyler Nordgren's book, yeah. Uh, now, for those of you who don't know, Tyler Nordgren is an astronomer and a night photographer and a national park buff. Uh, he wrote the book, uh, Astronomy in the National Parks. He covers meteor showers in there, and he has a photo in there where he did rotate, if I remember correctly, where he did rotate the meteors in the shower to produce a similar effect. Oh, I, I got to go see that. I'm going to have to go fact check that, but I think I'm right on it. I love Tyler's work, too, so I can't yeah. wait to dive into that. Cool. Um, but my point is that you were, I, I think that there's a line between what you did and if you were to take those sporadics and um, rotate wow. those right. and pretend that those were Perseid meteors as well. I could demonstrate that. <laughs> so there's, there's, there's a level of, fic there's, you know, I, I'm saying the fiction oh, is for not sure. binary. There's, um, you're right. Right. You're right. The, there's, there's levels to, to the fiction. Right. I could, I could have taken, let's say, let's see where I'd find this one. There's one juicy meteor that really pained me to take care of this guy right here. His, this is funny. This is rotated. This one is absolutely rotated. When I rotated this one, I could just say, I want you to look like you're coming from Perseus. So boom, done. This is what we're talking about. All right. That's fantastic. I love it. In fact, I think you belong down here, <laughs> you know, like, and I think you'd be better over here. So, um, yeah, you should go right through the heart of this. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I don't, I don't want to right. play on that. Yeah. See now, now in my book, that's where you're really getting into fiction. And then you could take that a step further and drop that meteor into a different photo. And then it's complete fiction. Correct. Um, right. So there's different, there's different levels here. There's a, there's tiers. And yes, you've created a fictional representation, um, but it's based in the reality of what actually happened that night. Correct. And if you take away all of the everything else, this is what the meteors look like. <laughs> You're using so few pixels for so much work. I mean, it doesn't really look like much when you look at it this way. It's like, a little disheartening. It is, but together, all of that work kind of makes makes sense, right? Yeah. Now I'm just going to take your your advice and I'm going to turn on light and see what happens. Eh, I would have to be pixel peeping. Okay. 
It's yeah. nice. I, my, my guess is that light and would work uh, well for some mm -hmm. and not as well for others. I think if right. I was doing it, I'd probably try light and yeah. see if it did a good job. And if it doesn't, then go in and, and pixel edit. it. Right. Yeah, I seem to see some brightness disappearing when I do that. Okay. This is this is fun. So, yeah, I, I this process is not for the faint of heart because to get here, you have to have gone through blog post one and two. I'm sorry, you have to have planned for and shot a meteor shower. But you might as well do it when you get here, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. No. I, th I think, you know, this photo that you created a great image. I mean, it's such a good image that for two and a half years, we've been using that as the example anytime we talk about meteors. Um, and, uh, and I do remember Nikon was interested in using that photo until they found out it wasn't a Nikon lens on the camera, <laughs> which you were very honest about. Kudos to you. Um, but it's, it's a great shot, you know, and um, I think that is tedious as the process is to produce it it is dramatically better than a photo of just one meteor streaking through the sky um, i've seen precious few photos where one meteor really made a wow photo because you know that if you're if you've got a composition set up wherever that meteor comes in is random and it's so rare that it actually contributes to the composition you know, you can say, oh, wow, that's cool. I captured a meteor. And yeah, there is an exciting aspect to that. But if it's not contributing to the composition, so what, right? I mean, that's the bottom line. Is it making the photo better? And usually it's not. But with your technique and you know, you're doing what you did, um, that made for a dynamic photo. You're right. You're right. It's a, the purpose is, is the reason. That sounds so dumb. <laughs> Well, you know, it's live, so it's out there now. Wow. Well, <laughs> quote me on that, folks. The purpose is the reason. Yeah. We're going to do t-shirts, right? The purpose is the reason. Mad Hill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. Usually take group credit, but that will let, we'll, we'll attribute that one to you. No, just push me on front of that bus. <laughs> so Jen Bookman said, could you copy the mask and invert it on the second layer to avoid that issue? Um. I know that was back a ways when you, you left that comment, Jen. Um, yeah, not every meteor is made the same. So I don't, I don't think it, it would really work that well. Oh, you're talking, no, this is probably about the sky versus the ground. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. I mean, um, I could try that too. In this case, it was faster for me to use the wand, the magic wand to select. And then click on the layer mask icon and it was done. I think it would take more actions to copy a mask and invert it. Maybe it wouldn't, you know, option drag it and then hit command yeah. I. Yeah, I think uh, Jen's right. It, it, it would work, um, but like so many things in Photoshop, there's 10 ways to do it. Right. Um, and yeah, Jen, you're, you're right. That's definitely a viable approach. Yeah, so. So, wow, my, my PSB with double the amount of layers is like seven and a half gigabytes. So if, if you're going to do something like this, um, resist the urge to flatten it immediately. Reserve some drive space, let it sit, let it mellow for like a week, maybe a year. Um, and then commit to it when you're like, okay, I, I don't feel like re-editing this again for a year, you know, whatever. Um, uh, yeah. And and good luck. We want to see if if you guys if you guys have shot a meteor uh, radiant sequence and you've made your edit um, and if we had any influence on that um, or even not, we'd love to see what you did. Uh, post it in the comments uh, comments here on YouTube on our blog posts. We'd love to see it. Submit it for our Thursday night image reviews. That would also be great. Um, I will be joining, I think, Tim this Thursday at eight o'clock. Uh, so. And and I'd like to see some of those meteor shower radiants, especially if they came from this meteor shower that's, that we're still in right now. That'd be fantastic. Um, I hope Lance submits one. And then I'm just like, oh, I know that image. Uh, yeah. And wow. Yeah, I, I feel like I just got to the end of a marathon yeah. um, for lots of reasons. Um, yeah. We had an epic trio of posts 
and and one other special edition because of that. Why don't, why don't you talk to us about? Yeah, well, um, uh, not to get into too much behind the scenes stuff, but uh, Matt, this is something you and I have been talking about for about two, two and a half years now. Uh, after you did that shoot, um, uh, you, you know, you had talked about writing a how-to about it and we decided to put it off until the next really good meteor shower right. uh, for our photography. Um, and there was one last year, but it coincided with us launching our 2020 schedule. Right. Um, and so we put it off to this year because we had these four really good meteor showers. And part of the part of what we've been planning on doing that whole time, and it, I mean, I was so excited, it kind of drove me nuts to have to wait this long to do it. But we did this trio of blog posts, and then we uh, used that and then created some other content and created an ebook on shooting meteor showers. Uh, and that's part of what we launched yesterday um i can go over uh show you so this was the blog post uh, from yesterday and uh, right at the top here we announced the ebook uh so this is available on our site um uh, as a download um, we're offering it for free you can download this for free or if, uh, if it has some value to it that you'd like to share with us, then we have a name your price option as well. Um, so you can feel free to come in and just download this and have it or, um, or, or contribute to the making of it. And that's great too. Um, but mostly we, we wanna share this information and, and, and um, uh, you know, let you guys share in what we did and uh, share in uh, just what we know about night photography and, and get everybody doing this in our community and beyond. Uh, so we've got the book that uh, those three blog posts are in it. And then we also have 10 amazing places to photograph a meteor shower. It's this great essay that Lance wrote, um, sort of his dream locations for meteor shower photography, not just in the US, but around the world. Um, and then we also have gearing up for a meteor shower shoot. So it's uh, 10 pages of gear suggestions uh, for going out and shooting meteor showers. And then I will, uh, I'll tease this too. Uh, we're gonna add to the book um, a little bit of a guide on all the major meteor showers of the year and uh, which ones are better for photography in uh, the northern and, some, uh, northern and southern hemisphere. Little tidbits like that to give you even a little bit of an extra head start on planning your next meteor shower shoot. Um, and I can you know, show you. Uh, right here. Let's see. Um, we're going to show you what the book looks like. So uh, here you go. So um, like I said, here's the contents. This is uh, all the information we're talking about. The gear guide in particular. Um, well, let's see. Here's uh, the 10 amazing places to photograph a meteor shower. You probably recognize some of these. Uh, Lance and uh, Matt and I, we were just here a few, geez, it feels like a few weeks ago, it was a season <laughs> ago now, wasn't it? Um, and, um, oh boy, this would be great, wouldn't it? I mean, all these spots, Lance did a great job of putting this together. Um, and then, but here, I mean, you got to check out the gear section. Um, all this stuff, uh, Gabe kind of uh, uh, headlined putting all this together and, and figuring out what kind of gear would be great for a shoot. Oh, the BenQ monitor that just won the, uh, the award. And of course the coast flashlights. Uh, this is something I came across. I love these, you know, I, for years, I mean, we've all, any photographer keeps a notebook in their bag, right? To make notes um, about your shoot. But I love these notebooks, these national park themed notebooks. Um, so yeah, so here's just all this stuff. This is all the stuff that's in the ebook. So feel free to go and, and download that. Um, but this whole thing was so much fun to put together. And wow, and wow, what a what a group effort! Yeah, yeah. Just like the blog. Just like the blog. Yeah, yep. just like the blog. And uh, speaking of the blog, let me uh, show one other thing. We haven't shared this. Uh, we haven't shared this with the public yet. Uh, but uh, something exciting about our blog. If you've been following the blog, uh, we definitely appreciate that. Um, so we've been writing the blog for about five years now is that right we in our fifth year writing yes. the blog every every week having a post and let's see i want to go let's go to the blog 
So if you look down the side of the blog here in the sidebar, these are all the posts we've written going back pretty far, right? So we started this back way. in January of 2016, right? That's a lot of blog posts you can see. And one of the things, a couple of people have asked us about this and we were not, um, we were not oblivious to it. It, it. I mean, it can be kind of hard to find specific content in here unless you know exactly where to look for it. So something that we just added to the blog a couple of weeks ago, and this is the first time we're mentioning it, uh, we're gonna we're gonna socialize this in another week or two, but right up at the top, now you can see this posts by topic link right up here, and if I click that, that's gonna bring up this page that organizes all of our blog posts by topic. So you can see right up at the top astronomical events, and there are our three meteor shower posts, um, best practices, our kind of essays on creativity, all the gear stories we've done, the uh, essays we've written. Uh, events that we've been a part of, um, things about exposure, our five question series. Here are the four gift guides. We do the gift guide every year. A whole series of how I got the shots. These are all the how I got the shot posts that we've done. Uh, a couple of humor pieces and um, uh, talking about light and light painting. Uh, news about our programs. This is a lot of workshop announcements and about the events that we've run. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So just broken down by topic, every blog post that we've published from the beginning. So pretty excited about that. So again, you can just check that out uh, right there. If you come to the sidebar of any blog page, you can see posts by topic. It's right there and easy to access. Chris, it's, it's amazing to see the body of work all in one place like that. It makes yeah, me right? stop and take a breath for a moment. And when say, did we have the time to do that? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. Well, wow. Um, yeah, it's been a joy working on it with all you guys. And we get a lot of great feedback from the people who read it. So thanks, everybody, for supporting it. Thank you, guys. We yeah. do it for you. That's right. And speaking of other things we do for you, um, with our new practice of, you know, everybody staying safe. And it just happened to coincide with other things we want to do anyway. We are live on the internet three nights a week. This is Tuesday, so it's blog chat. On Wednesdays, we have Instagram live. Uh, we're going to post up and that is, uh, you can come join us at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and who do we, do we know who we have on this week? Yeah, uh, tomorrow night's going to be Gabe and I. Nice. Yep. You guys decide on a topic yet? Pretty sure we're talking about the ebook. Yes. But uh, yeah, but it's an ask, you know, ask and, and pan anything. So uh, feel free to come and ask questions about shooting meteor showers, about the post processing, about the ebook, or anything you want. We're open to talk about uh, whatever's on your mind with night photography. Beautiful. Beautiful. And then I'm going to join an image review for the first time in an official capacity mm -hmm. um, on Thursday. And Tim and I, and I'm posting up the link in the live chat here. Good night right now, today or tomorrow, to submit an image or two for that so that we can see you live on Thursday for that. Yeah. If you want to submit uh, photos for the image review, just go to npan.co slash image review, and you can uh, send them to us with that form right there. Again, that's npan, N-P-A-N, dot co slash image review. And we're posting all of these in the comments. Uh, I'm sorry, in the description of the YouTube video once the stream is done. And they're in the live chat also. Mm -hmm. So we've got a couple of comments here. Um, so Jen did say for the sky and ground part, we got that right. Okay. Um, Sue says, uh, thanks. This is awesome info. And she's going to go try it on the lyrics now. Awesome. awesome. Great. So what are you doing still here? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hadley thanked us for, for the blog post and the ebook being very oh, helpful. No, thank you, Hadley. Thank you, Hadley. Um, Sue Wilson said thank you. Uh, and Jen also said thank you. And Sandra, great info today. Hey, Sandra. And Jerry said very nice. Um, and then Katrina said thanks, Matt and Chris. It's always helpful to see it done. We agree. It was challenging. I got to say, it was challenging to describe how to do it yeah. in written form and to pull out all these illustrations and stuff. That that was a different kind of work. So yeah. 
to pull out the PSD and to be able to sort of show you guys stuff. I, I was looking forward to that and I'm glad that we have blog chat for that. And I know Chris was on the other side making sure that everything was accurate too. So that's a different kind of work. <laughs> Uh, and Hadley is very grateful. The post by topic, he said the index will be very helpful. So good, good, good. Well, use it, use it, please use it. Yep. Uh, thanks for all the feedback, everybody. And always our ears are open. Feedback in the comments, feedback by email, adventure at nationalparksatnight.com. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful evening, and uh, we'll see you on the interwebs or on a workshop. All right. Okay. Good night. Good night.